Hi, it's Dwyer. Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Bettingangle.us, a free site. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now behind me are two men who were involved in a great series of fights. Right? Both guys had victories in that series. The guy about to hit the canvas is Jersey Joe Walcott. You might recall him as the champ whose title ended when he got knocked out in a fight he was dominating against the then unbeaten Rocky Marciano. I want you to focus on the other guy here. The guy who is sending Jersey Joe to the canvas. The other guy is one of history's best. He was a light heavyweight who killed a man. Now understand, he was not even the light heavyweight champ, folks. And he's widely regarded as one of the best light heavyweights ever. He killed a man. He was afraid that his punching power was too much for the light heavyweight division. So he went up to heavyweight. You're seeing how that power carried to the heavyweight division here. Right, Jersey Joe's on his way to the canvas here in the picture behind me. Understand, it's Ezra Charles, the guy sending him to the canvas, who ends Joe Lewis's reign. Now, I know we're in an era of 6'5", 6'6", 6'9", heavyweights who are ruling the roost. And we have a hard time, a very hard time, remembering when a guy like Ezra Charles could end the reign of Joe Lewis. By the way, Jersey Joe Walcott, who's hitting the canvas here, fought Joe Lewis in one of the biggest robberies in history, dropped Joe Lewis twice in a fight that the judges ruled Lewis won. Right? So these two guys were elites. But understand, boxing has moments where an Ezra Charles can beat a Joe Lewis. Where a Jack Dempsey, another smaller guy, can beat a Jess Willard, right? You need to look at light heavies. You need to look at cruiserweights. And you need to realize that they often have a coordination advantage on heavyweights. They're often faster. They often move better. They have punches that carry so, as you can imagine, there is folklore out there right now on why Jay Opataya ends up leaving the Tyson Fury camp after sparring all of five rounds with Tyson Fury. Let me just make a point here. Folks, you're not going to find out the truth for several years. Right? Just like we didn't find out the truth about Timothy Bradley's sparring sessions with the then unknown Terence Crawford. Right, Bradley, now in the Hall of Fame, <laughs> could safely tell us that he was getting his ass kicked by Crawford, who he didn't even know. That he was the champ at the time. He had a sparring partner who was supposed to be helping him prepare, and the sparring partner was teeing him up. And he had no answers over several days of camp. Right? There are sparring stories out there. But you don't hear them until the principals are well out of the ring, are already in the Hall of Fame, or have already just mentally moved on from the sport before they tell you the truth. What I can tell you is that, in my opinion, Tyson Fury is a great fighter who does his best work against bigger men. He's made for this era. He does his best work against Deontay Wilder. How tall is he? 6'7"? Vladimir Klitschko, how tall was he? Right, just understand that Tyson Fury, with guys a little bit shorter than him, 
is the more coordinated fighter is the more skilled fighter has the foot speed advantage knows how to fight you from distance has a mobile jab not a stationary jab he can move and fire that jab he's ambidextrous the guys who give him a problem are the Ezra Charles's of the world the J. Opatayas of the world Right? Who knows? Maybe one day we'll hear that Opatai was teeing off. That Fury couldn't have a guy who wasn't even in the weight class teeing him up. Like Steve Cunningham teed him up. In an actual fight. Right? I'm just telling you, folks. History is replete with these big giants. Right? Joe Lewis big for his era, getting beaten by an Ezra Charles, right? Jess Willard, the guy who beat Jack Johnson, getting beaten by a smaller Manasa Mahler, Jack Dempsey, right? Billy Kahn, teeing off on Joe Lewis for most of the fight, their first fight, right? Just, just understand, too, that I know we've been convinced these days that you have to be 6'4", 6 6'5", 6 6 6 6 to compete in the heavyweight division. That's not the history of the division. Right? Smaller guys, guys who are, let's say, 195 to 210, have ruled the roost. Anyone remember Joe Fraser? And often these guys are just too fast and too agile and still have the hellacious punch. Right, so we'll figure out the story with Tyson Fury, J. Opataya. Let me just say this too. Let's enjoy Opataya while he lasts because his next fight's a doozy. Which fighter gave Usyk the toughest match he's had as a professional. I would argue it's Maris Bredis, who happens to be the same guy who broke Obataya's jaw before. Right, look at the film of the fight. Obataya looks great early. He's too fast. He's too young. He's a southpaw. Right, you get the feeling Maris Bredis is there and he's done too much sightseeing. He doesn't know how to cut off the ring. He doesn't know how to do anything against Jay Obataya. But then you look at the later rounds. Let's just say we'll see who wins that Opataya Maris Breedis fight. I think it's a tough one. Let's keep talking here. Antonio Tarver, one of my favorites, right? His fight against Danny Green is a classic. I thought Tarver had a lot of skills. I thought Tar Tarver was. Fearless. Understand, the Danny Green fight doesn't take place at light heavyweight. It takes place at cruiserweight. And you saw the skill gap between the two guys. Of course, Tarver beats Roy Jones in the rematch. Uh, of course, Tarver is the guy who loses his title to another great Bernard Hopkins, who had jumped up from the middleweight division. Well, Tarver has said, look, if Fury beats Usyk, he doesn't have to fight Anthony Joshua. Right now, folks, let's just point out the obvious. Let's say Fury beats Usyk, and Usyk says, hey, I'm not even going to exercise the rematch clause. You've given me my first loss. One is enough. Uh, you've convinced me that I can't beat you. Right now, that's not the way I see the fight happening, but if it happens that way, What's Fury's next move? Right? I'll say this. I don't believe beating Francis Ngannou should allow you to jump the line, because that's what you're doing. Right? To jump the line, to have a shot on Tyson Fury. Right? If Tyson Fury were Vitaly Klitschko, right, who famously fought Derek Chisora 
after Chizora lost to Robert Hellenius because people thought Chizora got robbed. Right? If Tyson Fury were Billy Klitschko, Tyson would say, hey, who am I kidding? Let me stop kidding everyone here. There are a whole bunch of guys I haven't fought who are deserving. Right? Ergovic, come on down. Right? The winner of Joe Parker, Zhili Zhang, come on down. Right? I just unified against Usyk. Now I want the rest of the title. But let's be clear here, folks. <laughs> this is prize fighting. Guys are in it for paydays. You and I know the way the real world operates. The biggest names in British heavyweight boxing over the last 10 years, I would argue, are Anthony Joshua, the box office king, and Tyson Fury, the lineal. Right, folks, those are the biggest names. Right? Just understand, if those two fought each other, there wouldn't be an empty seat in the arena. Let me say this, too. I understand Saudi Arabia is throwing around a lot of money. But I privately hope, since that fight would be so big for the United Kingdom, that the fighters themselves, both of whom are multimillionaires, leave some money on the table and have that fight in the United Kingdom. Right, folks, that would be a huge fight. I mean, that would be a huge fight. Why would you want to have it outside of British soil? That doesn't make sense to me. Let me go one step further, and I know promoters are going to hate me for this. But I would make sure, too, that at least some of the tickets are reasonably priced. Right? You know, do something for the fans. Allow boxing hardcore people who can't afford, you know, high three figures for a seat that isn't ringside to actually attend the fight. Right? Have it be that when the fighters do their ring walks, they're walking in the ring before their crowd. So let me agree with Tarver. Right? Certainly Joshua can't show up and demand that Tyson Fury give him a shot at the title. But you and I know, I mean, we just know this, that that fight needs to happen. If Tyson Fury beats Usyk, becomes the first man professionally to beat Usyk, he'll have some latitude. Right? He can then pick his next opponent. Anthony Joshua would necessarily be in line. Again, I agree with Lennox Lewis. I agree with Tarver. Joshua doesn't have the moral authority to say, hey, I deserved a shot more than unbeaten Philly Pergovic. Right? You know, I deserved a shot more than Zhili Zhang. If Zhang beats Joe Parker. I deserved a shot more than Joe Parker. If Joe Parker beats Zhili Zhang. But you and I know, folks, this is a financial enterprise. It's professional prize fighting. If Tyson Fury wants the biggest payday, that's going to come against Anthony Joshua. You know, I have news for people too. Right? Tyson Fury has watched Anthony Joshua for years. These guys have been circling each other. I believe Joshua is an easier fight for Tyson Fury than would be Alexander Usyk. Right? I know they're going to do an optical illusion on us. Right? Francis Ngannou just dropped Tyson Fury. We're going to hear that every other round of this AJ Francis Ngannou fight. If AJ tees up on Francis Ngannou, the AJ crowd, and they're vocal here online. I hear from them often every time I mention AJ's name in a video. They're going to say, hey, our man, our man, 
has not only knocked out every common opponent he's had with Tyson Fury, our guy dusted off the guy who just dropped Tyson Fury. Right now, while that argument has a hole in it so big that it ignores the fact that Tyson Fury actually fought Deontay Wilder three times, right? Just understand, sooner or later, the box office takes over, right? There are more deserving guys in the heavyweight division for shots at the title. I don't see the bigger payday for Tyson Fury than a fight against Anthony Joshua should both guys win their next fights. I have my doubts that even that's going to happen. Let's talk about Freddie Roach, the great trainer. Right, Freddie Roach has reinvigorated some guys. Right, Miguel Cotto looked like he was on the tail end of his career. He joins up with Freddie Roach and he was reborn. Right? I personally think that Cotto Canelo fight was much closer than people thought it was the night of the fight. Right? Revisit that fight. Understand, Manny Pacquiao at one point is so upset with Freddie Roach after the Jeff Horn fight that he leaves Freddie. But like Ali with Angelo Dundee, who was in Jimmy Ellis's corner when Ellis fought Ali, right? Like Ali took back Angelo Dundee. Manny Pacquiao, as upset as he was with Freddie Roach, took back Freddie Roach. Freddie Roach is that good. Well, now Freddie Roach is the new trainer for Jaime Munguia, right? Freddie's even gone the extra step. <laughs> He's the hype man for Munguia. So in interviews, Freddie has said, hey, all these people out there, let me raise my hand, right? Not that Freddie named me or knows who I am, but I'm going to raise my hand. He said, all those people out there who are criticizing Jaime Munguia's defense, he's a good defensive fighter. I've seen him. The criticism is unwarranted. That's what Freddie's saying. Words to that effect, right? I'm going to disagree with Freddie. Maybe Freddie hasn't looked at films. <laughs> Maybe Freddie hasn't looked at films going back a few years of Jaime Munguia. Right? The Jaime Munguia I'm seeing would get killed by fighters like David Benavides. Right? Jaime, bless puncher. Hey, I'm not going to criticize the guy on the punching power. He's a blessed puncher. I'll give him the punching power. Right? That's his calling card. That's why he's an unbeaten fighter. It's not his defense, folks. I see Jaime throwing big shots. Then I see Jaime defenseless. Defenseless on tape. And you just think, man, you know, if I were, if I were advising <laughs> Jaime, if the name Canelo as an opponent ever came up, I'd say, nah, nah, we're not fighting. <laughs> we're not fighting Canelo. That's a different level. We're not fighting Benavides. Well, Jaime's fighting John Ryder. Folks, we'll find out whether this Jaime Munguia is a decent defensive fighter narrative works. Right? If Jaime was doing so well, what's he doing with the new trainer? Also, some of these records, right? I see a guy, and the guy's up around 40 wins with no losses, and then I'm thinking to myself, wow, how can a guy get to 40 wins with so many people in the sport around his weight class? And the guy has fought, let's name Jaime's biggest fights. Is it the Revianchenko? Right, at some point, and I know I'm sounding hard here, at some point, when do we start calling a guy a protected fighter? Right? I'm curious to find out who wins this fight against John Ryder. Right? But understand, John Ryder, who's promising. Right? Who looked good in the later rounds against Canelo. Who I thought beat Callum Smith. Right? John Ryder hasn't had a belt. 
right? When Canelo did his march through the 168-pound division and beat four champs in one weight class, John Ryder was not one of them. He didn't have a belt. This is supposed to be Jaime's big step up. Right? I think the public needs to look at this fight. Let's find out what the truth is. He has a new trainer. The new trainer is praising him. If Jaime has been that good, how come he hasn't fought a Charlo? How come he hasn't fought a Janabek? How come he hasn't fought a Benavides, a Morrell? I mean, understand, there are guys who've been in the sport long enough, like Benavides, to actually have had the belt two different times. How come none of those times coincided with a fight against Jaime Munguia? And understand, I'm not accusing Benavides of avoiding Munguia. Right? Think of all the guys at middleweight. Right? Canelo, Danny Jacobs, um, Eris Landy Lara. Right? You have a bunch of guys. Munguia hasn't fought any of them. Right? When do we, the fans, start to discount a guy's unbeaten record because the guy hasn't fought top-line opponents. Let me also mention another thing, and this needs to be mentioned. Right? You need to know the fighters who are a gambler's best friend. Right? Understand the way life works. You're on top. Everyone is your friend. Everyone wants a part of you if you're on your way to the championship, if you're unbeaten and stuff like that. The minute something goes wrong, at least 20% of the crowd leaves you. You understand that. If it goes wrong again, more hangers-on leave you. Right? The group that stays is the group that understands that stuff happens in life and that you're still talented and that you may have just run into the wrong matchup. Now let's remember who Joe Joyce was. Joe Joyce was the mandatory, folks. Joe Joyce was about to fight for a title. Now he made a mistake. We called it here online. He decided he was going to fight Jili Zhang. Did don't, did Joe Joyce not see the Ergovic fight? I was astonished. Understand, Zhang's a southpaw. Understand, Zhang is cagey. Understand, Zhang and Joyce has a punch, right? It stopped Joe Parker. By the way, that's where Joe Joyce was. He had stopped Joe Parker. Right? But if I had to list the biggest punches at heavyweight, right, I would say the top punch at heavyweight is a Deontay Wilder straight right hand. Right? I'll give Anthony Joshua credit. He's a blessed puncher. Folks, Zhili Zhang's a blessed puncher. He's on the very short list of blessed punchers. Right, I'll give Effie Ajaba an acknowledgement here. He's a blessed puncher. But understand, not everyone at heavyweight is a blessed puncher. You understand, if you pick a blessed puncher as an opponent, your opponent only has to be right once to beat you. Now, Joe Joyce, as I make this video, has only lost to one man. He lost twice to Zhili Zhang. It seems like everyone is off the Joe Joyce bandwagon. I know the Anthony Joshua crowd is out in force. He is the box office king. To the Joshua crowd, are you certain that your guy beats Joe Joyce? I'm not. Right, folks, let's remember Joe Joyce, in addition to beating Joe Parker, beat Daniel Dubois. By the way, both of those fights did not go the distance. So let me say this. Joe Joyce is getting his career back together. People have forgotten about it. 
people remember him on the canvas at the end of the second fight against Zhili Zhang off a right hook. Right, folks, you're a gambler. You understand people have off nights. Right, didn't Ali lose to Leon Spinks? Wasn't that Larry Holmes getting off the canvas against Ronaldo Snipes? Right, understand, people have off nights. Joe Joyce is still dangerous. Right, if Joe Joyce were to fight Anthony Joshua right now, and if Joyce were the underdog, as I suspect he'd be, and if I were to be getting better than a plus 150, why wouldn't I be on the Joe Joyce side of the play? Right? Understand, we now know a few more things about Joe Joyce. Right? Taking all those shots with your chin isn't a good idea. Right? Chin's dent. I'm sure Anthony Joshua would try to take out Joe Joyce. There's no question about that. But let's not get confused here. The guy didn't lose all of his talent overnight. The guy who beat him gave Philip Ergovic the toughest fight of Ergovic's professional career. Right? The guy who beat him was, like Joyce, a silver medalist in the Olympic Games. Right? You're a gambler while the room empties and everyone moves to the exit. While you have that, he's no longer unbeaten crowd that abandons the fighter. Gamblers need to stick around and see what Joe Joyce does next. The bigger the name, the better it is. Hasn't Joe Joyce already sparred with Tyson Fury? Right, does anyone here think that if Joyce were in the ring against Alexander Usyk, that Joe would bow out like Daniel Dubois did. I'm not saying Joe beats Usyk. What I'm saying is Joe would be driven for every round of that fight. Right? Understand too, sometimes a loss can be the best thing for a fighter. Because now, people are going to confusingly look at the tape and say, I can knock out Joe Joyce. Player, go ahead and try. Zhili Zhang was able to do it again. Southpaw, heavy puncher, much better fighter than most people give him credit for. Right? If you think you can duplicate what Zhili Zhang has done, go ahead and try. Just be careful what you ask for. I think Joyce is a player who gamblers need to keep track of, and I'm talking about today. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this YouTube video. Let me close by saying this. I met a guy once. Uh, he was part of my ex-wife's family. And he was an old guy, older black guy. And he was uh, from Cincinnati. <laughs> and let's just say he and I were talking boxing. And every time we started talking boxing, uh, it could have been around the welterweight division. The guy started talking about this man right here, Ezra Charles, right? The guy was from Cincinnati, and Ezra Charles was Cincinnati's fighter, right? And I'm just telling you, you know, many of these old fighters, just like Lou Duva, believes the best fighter he ever saw was Rocky Marciano, right? Understand we all have our favorites, Right? There are people out there, I know this firsthand, who believe that this man, Ezra Charles, was the very best. Just food for thought. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.